reaching out to neighbors in the kind of the ways. Paradoxically, some people found that sense of purpose that had been absent from their everyday lives. And Rebecca Solnit concluded the desires and possibilities are so powerful that they shine from wreckage, carnage, and ashes. Some of you have seen, you mentioned it coming up here, people always mention it, my series with Joseph Campbell on the power of myth. In the first episode, The Hero's Journey, we were talking about the influence on Campbell's own thinking, the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. Because Schopenhauer believed that the will to live is the primordial, fundamental reality of human nature, he puzzled over how some people override it and give up their life for others. In a famous essay, Schopenhauer asked himself, how is it that a human being can so participate in the peril or pain of another human being that without fault, spontaneously, he or she sacrifices his life or her life to someone else? How does it happen that what we normally think of as the first law of nature, self-preservation and survival, is suddenly dissolved and we put another's well-being ahead of our own? Campbell wrestled with this question on camera, as you saw, and then he told me the story of what had happened once near his home in Hawaii, up in the heights where the trade winds from the north come rushing down through a great ridge of mountains. People go there to experience the force of nature. They go there to let their hair be blown in the wind, and they go there sometimes to commit suicide. One day, Campbell said, two policemen were driving up the road, and they saw just beyond the raving a young man about to jump. One of the policemen bolted from the car and grabbed the fellow just as he stepped off the ridge. Somehow he held on to the man and the railing long enough until his partner, the second policeman, arrived and pulled the two of them back to safety. When a newspaper reporter asked the first policeman, why did you do that? You could have been killed. He answered, I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't let go. If I had, I couldn't have lived another day of my life. Campbell then asked me, do you realize what had suddenly happened to that policeman? He had given himself over to death to save a stranger. Everything else in his life had dropped away. The wishes and hopes, his dreams no longer mattered. What mattered was saving that young man even at the cost. Again, invoking Schopenhauer, he answered his own question. Such a psychological crisis represents the breakthrough of a metaphysical reality, which is that you and the other are two aspects of one life. And you're a pair, a pair of separateness. <laughs> is but an effect of the way we experience forms in time and space. Our true reality and our unity, our identity, is unity with all life. So that sometimes instinctively and sometimes deliberately, our actions affirm that reality through some unselfish act, some personal sacrifice. It happens in marriage, in parenting. It happens in relations with people immediately around us, and it happens. And this is the point, in our participation in building a society based on reciprocity. It is the fundamental truth of civilization. Give us this day our daily bread. Rebecca Solnit puts it this way. What actually sustains life is far closer to home and more essential, even if deeper in the shadows than market forces and much more interesting than selfishness. Most of the real work on this planet is not done for profit. It's done at home, for each other, for affection, out of idealism. And it starts with the heroic effort of parents to sustain each helpless human being through all those years before fending for ourselves becomes feasible. 
And then she says that work travels into a shadow system of kindness that provides soup kitchens, food pantries, and giveaways, takes in the unemployed, the evicted, and the foreclosed upon, defends the indigent, tutors the poorly school, comforts the neglected, provides loans, gifts, and donations, and a thousand other forms of practical solidarity, as well as emotional support, so that inch by inch, inch by inch, we transform or reform the system from the inside and out. I can tell you from my own neighbors that the command to love our neighbor is obviously one of the hardest of all religious concepts. But to recognize our connections to others goes to the core of life's history. And when you claim this as the truth of your life, when you live it as if it were so, you are threading yourself into the long 